not hold this one. I swear I'll repay you with the respect that is due to you. Why must you be in such a hurry to go, Mother? Because I have failed to see the goings on in this place. And this is no consideration to me at all. All my advice goes for nothing around here. There's no respect paid to anything, and everyone here has his own opinions. Oh, the place is a veritable bedlam. If you must, madam. Why, sir, you have a good deal too much to say for yourself, my girl. You don't know your place. Give your opinion on everything. Oh, but grandmama. You, my lad, are just a plain fool. Oh, I'm your grandmother, and I'm telling you so. I warned your father a hundred times over that you showed all the signs of turning out badly and bringing him nothing but trouble. I think. <laughs> you think? Oh, you are? <laughs> looks as if butter wouldn't melt in your mouth. But it's just as they say, I suppose. Still waters run deep. Now I hate to think of what you do on this line. <laughs> oh, mother! My oh, dear! You ought to set them an example. Their real mother did very much better. A woman who's only concerned with pleasing her husband has no need for so much finery, my dear. Uh, oh, come. After all, madam. As for I, you, my dear, I have the utmost esteem, affection, and respect for you as the sister of... Elvira! But you keep on advocating a way of life in which no respectable people should follow. Your Mr. Tartuffe is undoubtedly a very righteous man. He's a good man, and he all would do well to listen to him. It enrages me to hear him criticized by a adult as you. What? Am I to allow such a, a sanctimonious bigot to come and usurp tyrannical authority here in this very house? He forbids everything pious busybody that he is. And whatever he forbids deserves to be forbidden. He means to lead you along the road to salvation. My son ought to make you all love him. No, Grandmama. Neither my father nor anyone else can make me have any liking for him. His behavior infuriates me at every turn. I can only see one end to it. It'll come to a wrap between the scoundrel and me. It's bound to. <laughs> Oh, it's nothing compared with her son. 
During the late disturbances, Gorgon gained the reputation of being a reliable man who showed great courage in the king's service. But ever since he took a fancy to his precious Tartuffe, he seems to have taken leave of his senses. He dresses him as brother and holds him a hundred times dearer than wife or mother, daughter or son. The man is so confident of all his secrets and is his <laughs> trusted advisor in everything. As for Tartuffe, he knows Orgon's weaknesses all too well, and he means to make use of them. He gets money out of him constantly by means of candy humbug, has a hundred ways of deceiving him, and assumes the right to take us all to task. Oh, you are lucky to have missed the whole she delivered at the gate! But, as I caught sight of my husband, and he didn't even see me, I'll go wait for him upstairs. Oh, wait him here to save some time. I only want to say good morning. Uh, have a word with him about my sister's marriage. I suspect it is Tartuffe who is opposing him, who's pushing my father to these evasions. You know how closely concerned I am. Valère and my sister are in love, and I, as you know, am no less in love with his sister. Here he comes! Have a word with him about the marriage, if you would. Good morning, sister. Ah, oh, brother, it's good to see you back again. It isn't much like the countryside just now. Dorian! A moment, sister, please. Excuse me if I wish to ask the news of my family first and set my mind to rest. How has everything been in the few days I've been away? How are you doing? How is everybody? The day before yesterday, the mistress was feverish all day. She had a dreadful headache. And Tartuffe? Tartuffe? He's very well, hale and hearty in the pink. Poor fellow. In the evening, she felt faint. She couldn't touch a thing. Her headache was so bad. And Tartuffe? He slept with her. She ate nothing, but he very devoutly devoured a couple of partridges and have a hash leg of mutton. Poor oh, fellow. She never closed her eyes all through the night. We had to stay up with her until morning. And Tartuffe? Feeling pleasantly drowsy, he went straight up to his room, hopped into a nice warm bed, and slept like a top until morning. Poor fellow! Eventually, she yielded to our persuasions, allowed herself to be bled, and soon felt much relieved. And Tartuffe! <laughs> he dutifully took three or four, five good swigs of wine at breakfast to fortify himself against the worst that might happen and to make up for the blood the mistress had lost. Poor oh, fellow! <laughs> well, they are both well again now, so go ahead and tell the mistress how glad you are to hear that she's feeling better. She's laughing at you openly, brother, and though I don't want to anger you, I must admit, she's right. Can this man really have gained such an influence on you? Sister, you don't know the man you're talking about. I grant you I don't know him, but then, to see what sort of fellow he is... Sister, sister, you would be charmed if you knew him. You would be delighted beyond measure. He is a man who... who... He is a man... In short, a man. <laughs> Whoever follows his precept which has a profound peace of mind, He's teaching me to forego affection and free myself from all human ties. I can see mother, brother, sister, wife, all perish without caring that much. Fair human sentiments, I must say, brother. Oh, had you seen how I first met him, you would have come to feel for him as I do. Every day he would come to church and modestly fall on his knees just beside me. He would draw the eye of the whole congregation by the fervor with which he put forth his prayers, sighing groaning, kissing the ground in transports of humility. When I would try to go, he would offer me holy water at the door. I would offer him alms, but he would go and bestow it upon the poor of my very eyes. At length, heaven inspires me to give him shelter in my house. He keeps a reproving eye upon everything, and his concerns for my interests extends even to my wife. He warns me of those who make eyes at her, and is ten times more jealous for her than I myself. You wouldn't believe the length to which his piety extends. The most trivial failing on his part, he accounts a sin. So much so that the other day, he was full of self-reproach for having caught a flea while at his prayers and killed it. 
with too much vindictiveness. Cat, you are crazy, brother. That's what I think. Oh, you're trying to pull my leg with a tail like this. What do you intend on this foolery? Sister, what you are saying savors of atheism. You are somewhat tainted with it at heart. And as I have warned you a dozen times, you'll get yourself into some serious trouble. That's the way your sort of people usually talk. You have everyone as blind as yourselves. If one sees things clearly, one's an atheist. But heaven sees what's in my heart. We're not all duped by humbugs. The truly brave are not those who make the biggest noise, yet the truly pious are not those who make the biggest show. Could you make no distinction between true religion and hypocrisy? Yes, yes. There's no doubt that you are the most reverend doctor. You have a monopoly of knowledge, Sir Oracle, the Cato of our age. In comparison, the rest of us are fools. No, brother. I'm no reverend doctor. I have no monopoly of knowledge. I merely claim to discriminate between false and true, just as I know no man more worthy than those who are truly religious. I know nothing more odious than those who are sacrilegious and deceitful, burning with devotion, but seeking material advantage. And yet, the truly devout are easy to recognize. Their religion is gentle and humane. They are always ready to think well of others. They show no anger towards sinners. They reserve hate for sins themselves. These are my type of people, and the example one should follow. Your man, however, is of another kind. Dear sister-in-law, have you finished? Yes? I am much obliged. Wait, no, brother, please, one word. You remember you promised to lay your daughter's hand? Yes. And that you named a day for the happy event? True. Why then defer the ceremony? I don't know. Have you something else in mind? Maybe. Do you intend to break your word? I never said so. There is nothing, I believe, to prevent you keeping your promise. That's as may be. Why is it circumspectly giving an answer? The Lord has asked me to come and see you. God be praised. But I need to know your intentions. What do you mean to do? The will of heaven. <laughs> <laughs> but speaking seriously, I need to know your intentions. The Lord has your word. Are you going to stand to it or not? Goodbye. I fear the Lord is going to be disappointed in his love. I must warn of how things are going.
taught to. But father, I assure you I don't feel that way at all. Why make me tell such an untruth? But I mean for it to be the truth. And it is sufficient for you that it is what I have decided. What, Father, you really want me my to? My intentions, my girl, is that you should marry Tartuffe and make him part of the family. He shall be your husband. <laughs> I have made up my mind, and it is for me. What are you doing here? I was just, uh, um, I don't know, Master, how the rumor arose about the marriage between Marianne and Tartuffe, but ever since I heard about it, I treated it as a joke. <laughs> Why? Is it unbelievable? So much so that I won't believe it, even though you tell me yourself. I know how to make you believe it. Ah, uh, yes, but you are telling us it is a joke. I'm telling you what's going to happen, and before long, too. Oh, 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 oh. I'm telling you. It's no good. We shan't believe you. It's no joke in matter, I tell you. Don't listen to your papa. He's teasing. Ah, uh, if I once get annoyed. All oh, right, how can you, master? You have the appearance of a sensible man. How can you be so Listen, silly? you've got in the habit of taking liberties lately, my girl. I will tell you, I don't like it at all! <laughs> now, where were we? Oh, yes, Tartuffe. Certainly a wonderful man. Do let us discuss the devastating cross, Master, please! Anyhow, with all the money you have, why don't you choose a beggar for a son-in-law? Will you be quiet? If he's poor, that's all the more reason for respecting him. <laughs> this is an honorable poverty. My help may be able to afford him the means to escape embarrassment and enter back into his own possessions again. Lands which are quite well known in this part of the country. <laughs> Moreover, he's certainly a gentleman. Oh, yes, that's what he says. But all that boasting doesn't go over very well with his piety. Anyhow, Master, how can you bear to hand over your daughter to a fellow like that? When a girl isn't given her own choice in marriage, her virtue's in jeopardy. Her resolve to live as a good woman is dependent on the qualities of the husband she's given. Any man who gives a girl a husband she detests is responsible to heaven for the sins she commits. Well, I declare, I have to take lessons from her and I handle my own business. You couldn't do better than follow my advice. Let's waste no more time on such nonsense, my girl. I am your father, and I know what is best for you. I had promised you to Valere. But apart from the fact that he said to be a bit of a gambler, I suspect him of being a free thinker. I don't see him at church much. Oh, yes, and I suppose you have him run there at the very moment you get there yourself. Like some folk who only go there to be noticed. I'm not asking your opinion! Moreover, Tartu stands well with heaven, and that surpasses all earthly riches. You'll live together loving and faithful like a pair of turtle doves. Oh, I can never forgive myself if I allow you to make such an alliance. Will you be quiet, you reptile, with your impudent? No, can't you join the man like you're getting angry? Yes! This ridiculous nonsense is more than my temper can stand. I insist on you holding your tongue, or I will hold it for you. Right. But I shan't think any less because I don't say anything. Think if you like, but take care not to speak, or... Enough. I've weighed everything carefully as a wise man should. It's mad at not being able to speak. And without his looks being exactly a beauty, Tartuffe is such that... Ah, yes, a lovely mug, hasn't he? Such that if his other advantages don't appeal to you... Oh, she would be well off, wouldn't she? If I were in her place, no man could marry me against my will. I'd show him soon after ceremony, eh? The woman always has ways and means of getting what she wants. So. What I say has any effect on you. What are you grumbling about? I'm not talking to you. Then what are you doing? I'm talking to myself. <laughs> Very well. I shall have to give her a backhand for everything's yes. You can't do otherwise, my dear, than approve what I have in mind for you, and accept that the husband that I have chosen for you is... Why aren't you talking to yourself now? I have nothing to say to myself. <laughs> Not a word. Not a word, thank you. But I was waiting for I'm you. not so silly as that. You must show your obedience and fall in line with my choices. I scorn to take such a husband. <laughs> no, no. She's a thorough pest, that girl of yours. If I shall have to do anything, I shall regret it. I'm in no state to go on now. 
I'm so insensitive, impotence. I shall have to go outside and recover myself. Oh, Father, please wait. Can we discuss this some more? Please, Father. Having lost your tongue, do I have to do all of the talking for you? Fancy you let him put a proposal like that to you, not saying a word in reply. Well, what would you have me do in the face of the absolute power of my father? Whatever is needed to ward off the danger. But what? Tell him that one can't love another's bidding, that you'll marry suit yourself, not him, and that if he has such a fancy for his precious tattoo, he can marry him himself, and that there's no one to stop him. I confess that a father's authority is such that I've never had the temerity to say anything. Well, let's get down to business then. Valerius made proposals for you. I ask, do you love him or don't you? You do my love great injustice, Doreen. How can you ask such a question? Haven't I opened my heart to you many, many times? Don't you know how much I love him? How do I know that you that the young man really even appeals to you? You do me grievous wrong to doubt it, Doreen. I've shown my feelings all too clearly. So you do love him then? Indeed I do. And as far as you know, he loves you too. I believe so. And you both want to be married? Assuredly. What is it that you need to do about this other proposal? <sighs> to die by my own hand if they force me to submit to it! Oh, <laughs> splendid! You only need to die and you're finished with your troubles. That sort of talk infuriates me. Oh dear, you are tiresome, Doreen. You have no sympathy at all for other people's troubles. I have no sympathy with girls who are as faint-hearted as you are when it comes to the point. Well, what do you expect me to do if I'm timid? What lovers need is determination. And have I wavered in my love for Valer? Surely it's for him to deal with my father. What if your father's plumb crazy over his precious tartuke and breaks his promise about the marriage he decided upon? Is your lover to be blamed? But can I reveal my flat refusal and open defiance so much I'm in love? Do we expose my feelings for the world to see it? No, no. I don't want you to expose your feelings. I see now that you want to marry Mr. Tartuke, and come to think of it, it would be wrong of me to dissuade you. Such an alliance. Mr. Tartu's a fine fellow. Everyone prefers to him already. It's no small honor to be his better half. A fine fellow with his red ears and his red face. You will happily married to a husband like that. Oh, heavens! Oh, would you like to marry such a fine looking man? Oh, please stop talking like this and suggest to me to avoid your marriage. It's enough. I give in. I'm ready for anything. No, no. A girl must do as her father commands, even if he wants her to marry a monkey. Oh. <laughs> Oh, what are you complaining of? You're lucky. You'll be carted off to his little provincial town and you'll find it swarming with his relations. Oh, what fun you'll have meeting them all. And in carnival time, you'll be greeted by a grand ball with an orchestra and every now and again, faggoting the monkey and marry an show. If only your husband would. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Oh, can't endure it. Why don't you help me? No, please, Doreen. No, it must go through now. You deserve it. Dear Doreen. No. Please, I've always trusted in you. No, Tartuffe is your man. You shall have your fill of him. Oh, please, Doreen. No, I give you my word. You should be thoroughly Tartuffe. <laughs> Very well. Since my miserable lot doesn't move you, leave me alone with my despair. There my heart will find relief. I am one infallible remedy for my trouble. <laughs>
something I was quite aware of. What is it? That you are to marry Tartu. <laughs> that is certainly my father's intention. But your father? He's changed his mind. He's just put the new proposal to me now. What? Seriously? Yes, seriously. He's the target on the match. And what is your intention? I don't know. That's a fine answer. You don't know? No. No. But what do you advise you to do? What do I advise you to do? I advise you to take him. <gasps> you advise me to do that? Yes. You really mean it? Of course. It's a splendid offer. One well worth considering. Well, sir, I'll take your advice. I don't doubt you'll find little difficulty in doing so. Dory. Belair, no more than you in offering it. I gave it to please you. And I'll follow it to please you. We'll see what will come of this. So this is how you love me? You were deceiving me when... Oh, don't let us talk about that, please. You told me frankly I should accept the husband I was offered. Well then, this is what I intend to do, since you give me such salutary advice. Don't make what I said your excuse. You already made up your mind. You were just seizing on a frivolous pretext to justify breaking your word. That's true. You put it very well. Of course. You never really did love me at all. Alas, you may think so if you like. <laughs> yes. Yes, I may indeed. But I may forestall your design. For I know him to bestow both my hand and my affections. Oh, I don't doubt that in the least. And the love for which your good qualities inspire. Good Lord! <clears throat> Let's leave my good qualities out of it. They are slight enough, and your behavior is proof of it. But I know someone who will, I hope, consent to repair my loss once she knows I am free. Your loss is little enough, and no doubt you'll easily be consoled by the change. I shall do what I can, you may be sure. For to love, or one's love is scorned, is none possible purity. A very elevated and noble sentiment, I'm sure. Would you have any language for you indefinitely? So you throw yourself into the arms of another, and yet not bestow elsewhere the heart that you spurn? On the contrary, that is just what I want. Only, I wish it were done already. That is what you would like? Yes. You have insulted me sufficiently. You shall have your wish. And immediately. Very well. At least remember that it is you yourself who are driving me to this extremity. Yes. And that in what I am doing, I am only following your example. My example, so be it. Very well. You shall have just what you have asked for. So much the better. You'll never see me again. Capital. Huh? What? <laughs> Didn't you call? Me? You're dreaming. Good. Here, give me your hands, both of you. Come along, you. Ow! I'm gonna 
will not do. Now yours. Ow! What's the use? The heavens be quick. You love each other more than you think. <laughs>
All the petitions I've addressed to heaven have been concerned with your well-being. Well, you are too solicitous on my behalf. Ah, uh, one cannot be too solicitous for your precious help. I would have sacrificed my own life for the sake of yours. <laughs> that is taking Christian charity rather far. But I am truly grateful for your kindness. I do par less for you than you deserve. Well, I wanted to speak to you in private on a certain matter. I'm pleased that no one can overhear us. I too am pleased. <laughs> I need hardly say how delighted I am to find myself alone with you. It is an opportunity which I have besought heaven to accord me with vainly until this moment. Well, what I want is that you should speak frankly and conceal nothing from me. And my sole desire is that you should allow me the singular favor of allowing me to express all that is in my heart and assure you that anything I have said against those who were paying homage to your charms was not spoken in malice against you, but rather that the intensity of my pious I zeal and your... I take it in that sense and believe that it arises from your concern for my salvation. Yes, that is indeed so, madam, and such is the power oh, of my... you're hurting me. <laughs> it comes from excess of devotion. I never intended to hurt you, madam. I would rather... What is your hand doing there? And it comes from excess of devotion. <laughs> I never intended to hurt you. Um, I would rather simply... No, oh, please don't. I'm dreadfully ticklish. <laughs> <laughs> I love your dress. How soft the material is. Very true, but let us return to our business. They say my husband intends to break his promise to Belair and give his daughter to you. Now tell me, is it true? He did mention something about it, but to tell the truth, madam, that isn't the happiness I aspire to. Oh, my hopes of felicity lie in another direction. <laughs> My breast does not enclose a heart of stone. <laughs> Are you sure your thoughts are all turned heavenward? Your <laughs> desires are not concerned with anything here alone. A passion for the beauties which are eternal does not preclude a temporal love. Our senses can and do respond to those most perfect works of heaven's creation. Heaven has lavished upon you a beauty that dazzles the eyes and moves the hearts of men. I am resolved to avoid your sight, leaving you to be an obstacle to my salvation. But at length I came to realize, O oh, fairest amongst women, that there need be nothing culpable that cannot reconcile with virtue. Since then I have surrendered to it, body and soul. My hopes, my happiness, my peace are in your keeping. On you my future bliss or misery depends. Make me forever happy, if such be your will. Wretched, if you would have it so. Uh, a very gallant declaration, but a little surprising, I must confess. It seems to me that you ought to steel yourself more thoroughly against temptation and consider more deeply what you are about. A pious man like you, a holy man who... Ah, but I'm not less a man for being devout. I realize that such a declaration coming from me may well seem strange, but after all, madam, I'm no angel. <laughs> if you are to condemn these declarations I have made, you must lay the blame on your own enchanting loveliness. <laughs> Those lances throw down my stomach heart's defenses and turn all my thoughts to love of you. My eye, my signs are told you a thousand times what I am now seeking to express in words. If you should turn an eye upon the tribulations of your unworthy slave, then I would offer you forever, oh, miracle of loveliness, a devotion beyond compare. At my hands, you need fear no danger of disgrace. <laughs> I offer love without scandal, satisfaction without fear. <laughs> you say, and your eloquence has made your meaning sufficiently clear. But are you not afraid that I might take it into my head to tell my husband of this charming <laughs> declaration of yours, and that such a disclosure might impair his friendly feelings for you? Oh, 
Oh, I'm not blind, and man is but flesh and blood. <laughs> Others might perhaps take a different course. <laughs> <laughs> but I prefer to show discretion. I shall say nothing to my husband, but in return I must ask one thing of you. Yes. That you give your support openly and sincerely to the marriage of Valera and Marianne. Renounce this improper influence by which you've sought to promote your own husband. No! <laughs> this must be made known! <laughs> I was in there! Oh, 
Alas, for my own part, would willingly do so. I would do anything for him and gladly, but the interests of heaven forbid it. If he is to remain, then I must leave. If he was to say he will mind I was afraid of him, and that I sought an arrangement with him to keep his mouth shut. That's putting me off a specious excuse. Your arguments are all too far-fetched. Why should you concern yourself with the interests of religion? Can't heaven punish the guilty without assistance from us? Let us just obey heaven's commands and not bother our heads about anything else. I have already said I forgive him. That is doing what heaven commands. But heaven does not command me to live with him after the scandal and insults put on me today. And does it command you to want an heir to fall his fantastic caprices, or to accept the gift of possession to which you have no rightful claim? People who know me will not suspect me of self-interests. Worldly wealth makes little appeal to me. It's tawdry living does not dazzle me. If I intend to accept the gifts the Father insists on giving me, it is only because I feel that such precious objects may go to unworthy hands or go to people who will use them for evil purposes and not intend to use them as I do. To the glory of God and the good of my neighbor. <laughs> 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 My good sir, put aside these delicate scruples. They'll get you into trouble with the rightful heir. If heaven has really inspired you with an inability to let your same pass into me, wouldn't it be better that you should prudently withdraw rather than let a son be haunted from his father's house on your account in the face of all right and reason? Believe me, thou will be showing some sense of decency. And it is now half past three, madam. Certain. Highest public way, obligations require my presence. Pardon my leaving you so soon. <laughs> Had the accusation been true, you would have been in a much different state of mind. 
But why must the woman behave as if her honor is imperiled by a mere declaration of love? For my part, I just laugh at such advances. I would rather we defended our good name by less violent means. No woman need be a dragon of vindictiveness. A snub, coolly and discreetly given is, I think, sufficiently effective in rebuffing advances. All the same, I know where I stand and I'm not weep at all. I wonder more and more at this strange infatuation. But what would you say if I were actually to show you that we were telling you the truth? Show? Yes. <laughs> Rubbish. Supposing I could contrive a means of letting you see with your own eyes. The very idea. Oh, what a man you are. Do at least give an answer. I'm not asking you to take my word for it. Supposing I could arrange for you to see and hear everything from, from some point of advantage. What would you say then about this godly man of yours? I shall say nothing, because it just can't be done. Oh, this delusion has lasted too long. I've had enough of being accused of deceiving you. It is necessary now for my own satisfaction that I may do a witness to the truth. And without more ado. Very well. I'll take you at your word. Let me see how you make good your promise. Tell him to come down. He's cunning. He may be difficult to catch. No. People are easily taken in by what they love, and vanity predisposes them to deception. Tell him to come down. And you two must retire. <laughs> <laughs> What? It is essential that you should be completely hidden. But why on the table? Oh, for heaven's sake, I know what I'm doing. Get under there and find now not to be seen or heard. You're asking a great deal of me, I must say, but I suppose I must see it through now. Now, I don't think you'll have any cause to complain. I'm going to play a rather unusual role. Don't be shocked. Because you reduced me to it, I intend to coax this hypocrite into dropping his mask and encouraging his audacity. It will be for you to call a halt to his insensate passion. <laughs> you can spare your poor wife to no more than is necessary to disabuse you. You always oh, recover. Take your not to be seen or heard. <laughs> I was in poem that you wished to speak to me. Yes. <laughs> I have a secret to tell you. Oh, but shut the door and have a good look around in case we should be overheard. We don't another business like this morning. <laughs> Of its own felicity. If 
if I may be allowed to have the matter, frankly, madam, I'll never trust these feelings until I've been perhaps some small poor taste of the favors for which I yearn. Yes, that alone will reassure me and give me absolute confidence in your intentions towards me. Oh, but why must you go so fast? When you have me reveal all at once what I feel for you, I have overstepped the bounds of modesty in confessing my feelings, and yet it isn't enough. Can there be no satisfying you without going to ultimate lay? But, if you look upon my best with such a painful eye, why refuse me such convincing proof? Oh, but how can I consent to what you wish without offending the same everyone? The fear of heaven is the only obstacle in my passion. That is a barrier I can easily remove. That we won't restrain you. Oh, but they threaten us with the wrath of heaven. I can dissipate these foolish fears for you. I know the way to remove such scruples. It is true that certain forms of indulgence are forbidden, but there are ways and means of coming to you. <laughs> Secrecy with me, and the only harm in the action lies in its being known. The public scandal is what constitutes the offense. Sin, sin, and sin are no sins at all. <coughs> Very well. I see that I must yield and consent to accord you with everything you wish. <sighs> but if in consenting I offend the one who forced me to such extremity, the fault can surely not be accounted mine. Yes. Upon me, be it so. Why bother with him? Between ourselves, he's a fellow one can lead by the nose. <laughs> oh, all the same. Do go out and check. Oh, 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 oh. What was that? What does he mean? 
matter. Why? What does he mean? What he said makes me realize my mistake. My deed of gift begins to worry me. Your deed of gift? <laughs> yes. There's no going back upon it now. Why? What is it? I'll tell you everything, but first I must go and see if a certain strong box is oh. still upstairs. <laughs> the country. In it contains documents on which he told me his life and property depended. And why did you trust them to someone else? Because of a scruple of conscience. I went straight to the scoundrel and took him into my confidence. He persuaded me that it was better to let him have the strong box so that, in case of inquiry, I could deny that I had it. And yet safeguard my conscience so far as being false testimony was concerned. You're in a difficult position, it seems to me. Ah. What's more, it was most unwise to provoke him when he had such a you. you ought to have been more conciliatory dealing with him. What, with a fellow who could hide such double dealing, such wickedness under the outward semblance of art and piety? A man whom I took into my house as a penniless beggar. No, that's finished with. I'll have no more to do with godly men. I'll hold them in utter abhorrence in future. I'll consider nothing too bad for them. There you go again, no moderation in anything. You must always be rushing from one extreme to the next. You see your mistake now? Distinguish petite virtue in the outward appearance of it. Don't be so hasty bestowing your esteem, and keep a sense of proportion. Is it true, father, that this scoundrel is threatening you? That he's insensible to every benefit, and that in his wicked and outrageous pride he's turned your own generosity against you? It is, my son, and a dreadful grief it is to me, too. Then leave it to me. I'll crop his ears for him. No half measures with the scoundrel like that. I'll undertake to rid you of him without delay. I'll settle the business. I'll deal with him. That's typical young men's talk. What are your feelings, for goodness sake? We live in, aid, in an age and under a government where it goes ill with those who resort to violence. What's all this? What are all these strange goings on I've been hearing about? Aye, uh, strange indeed. I saw them with my own eyes, too. This is the reward I get for my pains. In sheer kindness of heart, I relieve a man in his misery. Receive him into my house, load him with kindness, treat him like a brother, give him my daughter! No. And what does the infamous scoundrel do but foul the endeavors to seduce my wife? Oh, not content with that, he has the audacity to turn my own benevolence against me. He threatens to ruin me with the weapons of my own unwise generosity put into his hands, deprive me of my possessions, and reduce me into the beggar from which I rescued him. Poor fellow! <laughs> Guilty of such wickedness. How do you mean? People are always envious of the righteous. Whatever are you talking about, Mother? I mean that there are queer goings on in this house, and I know very well how much they all hate him. What is their hatred do with what I'm telling you? I told you how many times when you were a little boy. Virtue on earth is persecuted ever. The envious died, but dead me never. What has that to do with what has happened? Then I made up a hundred idle tales about him. This what? They would. They have. This is ridiculous talk. When I tell you I saw him, I mean I really did see it. And when I say I saw it, I mean I really did see it. <laughs> Must I go on saying it? How many times am I to tell you? Must I bawl it at the top of my voice? Good heavens. Appearances can often be deceptive. One shouldn't judge by what one sees. You'll drive me mad. Oh, it's human nature to think evil of people. Goodness is often misinterpreted. Am I to interpret it as kindly solicitude when I see him trying to kiss my wife? One ought never to make accusations without just cause. You should have waited until you were quite certain of his intentions. What the devil? How was I to be more certain? Should I have waited until he... Should I... Until he... Oh. 
<laughs> yeah, don't drive me to say something that I shouldn't. No, 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 no! He's far too good a man! I just can't imagine he meant to do what you are saying he did. Oh, if you weren't my mother, I don't know what I'd say to you! I'm so angry! It's the way of the world, Master. You refuse to believe once, and now she won't believe you! We're wasting time on this nonsense, which we ought to be used for making plans. We can't afford to go to sleep in the face of the scoundrel's threats. Why? Do you really believe he'll have the audacity to carry them out? Well, I can't think he'd have a case. His ingratitude is too glaring. I shouldn't rely on that. He'll find whatever means to justify whatever he does to you. I repeat what I said before. When he had such a hold upon you, you ought to have never provoked him so far. Oh, what could I have done? The audacity of the villain was such that I wasn't faster of my own feelings. I only wish we could patch up some sort of reconciliation. Oh, had I known what a strong position he was in, I would never have been a party to making such a fuss. What does this fellow want? No one wants it see. I'm in a fine state for anyone to come to see me. Good afternoon, dear sister. Pray, let me speak with the master. He has company just now. I don't suppose he'd be seeing anyone. I'm not for being troublesome. I don't think I'll find my visit unsatisfactory. He'll be quite pleased with what I've come about. Your name? Just tell him I'm here on behalf of Mr. Tartuffe and for his own good. It's a man who's come on behalf of Mr. Tartuffe. He's very civil about it. This is his business is something you'd be pleased to hear. We must see what the man wants. Perhaps he's come to reconcile us. How should I behave to him? Don't show your resentment. If he's for coming to an agreement, you must listen. How do you do, sir? May heaven bless you and found those to seek to do you harm. His civil beginning confirms my impression. It means a reconciliation. I've always been very devoted to your family. I was once in your father's service. You must forgive me, but I don't recognize you. Excuse me, but I don't know your name. Loyal's the name. Norman by birth and bail up to the courts, and let those that envy me want to. I can rightly claim to discharge my duty with credit this forty year now. Heaven be praised. Now I've come, sir, to serve this writ upon you, excuse the liberty. What? Me? I'm taking quiet, sir. It is only a writ and order to leave this house at once. You and yours and bag and baggage. Make <laughs> <laughs> way at once. Without delay and without fail, you're provided. What? Me leave the house? That's it, sir. Now, if you don't mind, this house is, as you be duly aware, good Mr. Tartuffe, so no question about it. He is Lord of Master your possessions. What marvelous impudence! I want nothing to do with you, sir. It's this gentleman I'm speaking with. But, yes, sir. I know you'd never resist authority, not in any consideration. You would allow me to carry out my orders as a gentleman should. You may as well get a hiding for all your black gown, Mr. Bates. Ask your son to hold his tongue, sir, or retire. I'd be very sorry to have to warn you. He should be disloyal, not loyal by the looks of him. I have a soft spot for town events. I like to service of this grace in consideration for you, sir. You sought the shock and fond to anybody who might have had the same feeling for you that I have. But would not have gone about things so considerate like. And what could be worse than ordering a man at his own home? We are giving you time. I'll give the same execution till tomorrow. I must ask for the keys, of course, before you go to bed. My man will help you. I picked a hand enough that will get everything out. <coughs> it seems I've shown you every consideration. I say from you, sir, that you will do nothing to hinder me in the discharge of my duty. Oh, I willingly give the last hundred louis I possess for the pleasure of letting you upon your lovely snout. Steady, don't do anything foolish. I can hardly restrain myself before such unheard of insolence. I'm itching to be Adam. Oh, that fraud back of yours would do the good dusty, Mr. Oh, Loyal! <laughs> Talking about thinking you love troll, my lass, a lot less than as well, you know. That's enough, sir. We'll leave it at that. Give us the document and go. Good day, then. The Lord be with you all. I and the devil take you and him who sent you. Oh. Well, mother, do you see? Do you see now what kind of a rascal Tartuffe is? You're on your arse, madam. You no! <laughs> have no cause to complain him, no right to blame him. It's all part of his pious intentions. It all fits in with his love for his neighbor. It's pure <coughs> charity on his part to rob you of everything that might stand in your way of salvation. Will you be quiet? I'm 
always happy to remind you. We must take counsel of what course to follow. Oh, yes, go and expose this ungrateful scoundrel. This last act of his must invalidate the deed of gift. His treachery must appear too obvious to permit him success we fear. <laughs> intelligence, in confidence, and you must fly immediately. The scoundrel denounced you to the king an hour ago and put into his hands a strong box whose secrets he contends you have kept in breach of your duties as a subject. Now, I know no particulars of the offense with which you are charged, but a warrant has been issued for your arrest, and to ensure effective service of it, Tartuffe himself has been commanded to accompany this person who is to apprehend you. Tartuffe? Yes, I must admit it. The man really is a monster. And so he strengthens his hand. That's what it means to make himself master of your possessions. The slightest delay may be fatal to you, sir. Now, I have my carriage at the door to take you away and a thousand guineas which I brought for you. However, we must lose no time. This is a shattering blow indeed. And there is no avoiding it except by flight. By flight? By flight or flight? Now, I offer you my services to conduct you to some place of safety, and I will stay with you until you are out of danger. Alas, how can I ever repay your kindness? But I must leave my thanks for another time. May heaven someday allow me to come and return the service. Farewell, all of you. Good ones, brother. We'll see that everything necessary is done. Gently! Oh, oh, <laughs> you don't need to go very far to find lodging. You are a prisoner in the king's name. Villain! Oh, to keep this trip to your last, this is the blow whereby you finish me. The master stroke to all your treachery. Your words are powerless to move me. I am schooled to suffer everything in the curls of heaven. Yes, I am fully aware of the assistance you gave me, but mine was due to the obligations of my king, and that certain obligation is so strong on me as to extinguish in me all gratitude to you. To that allegiance, I would sacrifice friends, wives, kinsmen, and myself with them. Remarkable feast is empty. Oh, how the dark makes a mockery of heaven! Not all your rage can move me. I have no other thought but to fulfill my duty. What credit can you hope to reap from this? How can you regard such employment as honorable? And do you not remember, ungrateful wretch, that it was my charitable hand which rescued you from your indigence? Any employment was need the honorable that comes from which authority that sent me here. Imposter! How cunningly he cloaks his villainies in the mansion of all we most revere. This consuming zeal of which you boast is as grand as you say, then why did it not come to life so we punch you with this one? Pray! Deliver me from this futile promise, sir. Proceed to the execution of your orders. <laughs> Of your formal loyal service 
and to let you see that he is never insensible to true merit, that he can reward the action when least expected, and that he chooses to remember good <coughs> rather than you. Heaven be praised! Now I can breathe again! Oh, oh. happy end to all our troubles! Who could have foretold this? So you see, you villain! Ah, mother, forbear! Do not stoop to such indignity. Leave the unhappy creature to his fate. Add nothing to the remorse which must now overwhelm him. Rather, hope that he may henceforth return to the paths of virtue, reform his life, and learn to detest his vices, and so earn some mitigation of the justice of the king. Meanwhile, for your own part, you must go on your knees and render appropriate thanks for the benevolence his majesty has shown you. Now, his majesty. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 